Good morning. It's lovely to see your faces, to be with you, and to know that we have ahead of us God's presence, to commune with him, to do so together. Uh, We are looking forward to that, I hope, and looking forward to being strengthened and challenged and encouraged. Let's spend some time just quieting our hearts and our minds as we focus ourselves on this great privilege and task ahead of us. Please stand as we hear God's call to worship. I don't know what has happened in your week this week. I don't know what things are on your mind and heart. But here we're called to give thanks to the Lord. Um, If you have difficult things on your heart and mind, you might think, well, how can I give thanks? Well, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are redeemed by Him, if you've been redeemed from the hand of our enemy, the devil, then you have much to give thanks to the Lord for. You have much um, experience of His goodness. Hear now His call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands, from east, from west, from north, and from south. Would you pray with me? Lord God, mighty, faithful, infinite, glorious, Redeemer God, we come this morning and we bow our hearts and minds before you. We ask that you would fill us with your goodness, with your covenant love, which you have shown each one of us who is united to your Son. You have brought us from darkness to light. You have brought us from spiritual death to life You have caused us to be raised up into the heavenlies that we are now seated with Christ there. Oh Lord, You are working in us to make us more like Your Son. You are giving us victory over our sin. And You have set before us a glorious future. Your goodness to us is wonderful it overflows. And so, Lord, we pray, help us. Take from us all distraction. Cause our hearts to be filled with Your character, that we, with all that we are, might worship You this morning. We ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, please take your hymnals and turn with me to hymn number 29. Hymn number 29, this is based on Psalm 103. It's praise my soul, the King of heaven. And here we are singing to God, praising Him for His greatness. He is our King. And He is also our Redeemer. He's the one who's shown us 
grace and favor, the one who's shown our fathers grace and favor. He's the one who cares for us like a father. He is our great redeemer. So let us sing to our God. Hymn 29, praise my soul, the King of heaven. consider that our God is our Redeemer, and therefore it's, it's right that we confess our sin and recognize that we are indeed those in need of a Redeemer. We're going to do that now as I lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, the love which you have shown us in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, knows no bounds. It is truly beyond our ability to comprehend. And yet, Lord God, so often we practically have small views of it. It does not move our hearts in the way it should. It doesn't bring us to the end of ourselves in wonder. We take it in and pass over it as a matter of course or as something that we've heard and mastered. Oh Lord, would you forgive us So often, Lord God, we have not 
shown even this week a return of love unto you that is any way matching the love which you have shown unto us. Of course, Lord God, we cannot do that, but we have not even gotten anywhere close. We have not loved you with our whole hearts right down into the depths of our beings. Lord, forgive us for our coldness of love, for our half-hearted love, for our love that has gone so far but should have gone further. Help us, Lord God, to look unto you for greater grace and strength. May we not be overcome by our sin, but rather be humbled by it, that we might seek you afresh with greater earnestness and greater dependence, that we might love you, though it be so insufficient, with all that we have and all that we are, in union with your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the power of his Spirit. Amen. Well, having confessed our sin, we now turn to confess our faith. We are saying again that these are the things that we believe. Uh, this is the solid rock that we stand upon when uh, we consider our own shortcomings and when we consider the lies of the world all around us. We're going to confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed this morning, and that can be found on page 454 in the blue Sing Psalms books. Would you stand with me? O oh, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. With the collection, please be brought forward. Earlier in our service, we sung praise to the King of Heaven. We talked about bringing our tribute to Him. And that was, of course, a tribute of praise. But in a sense, our tithes and offerings are also a tribute unto him. They're a recognition that he is our king. Uh, they are a tenth of, of our earnings or whatever he has allowed you to give. And they're a tangible way of saying, Lord, you own all that I have. In fact, you've given it to me. And so I give you back a portion of what you have first given to me. Well, let's pray now, praying for these things and also uh, for the pastoral concerns of our congregation. Lord God, we come before you as our King, and we worship you with our tithes and offerings. This is not just a practical step in our worship, but it is indeed a very real part of our worship. It is something that is spiritual as we give unto you a part of that which sustains us, recognizing that indeed all that sustains us has been first given to us by you, recognizing as well that you are a king, one who has a right to demand our allegiance 
and yet does so with such loving power, making us willing to serve you in the day of your power. O Lord God, we pray that we would worship you with these tithes and offerings. We also pray, Lord God, for our own congregation, and we ask that you would enable us to reach out to those who live around this building. We pray, Lord God, that you would enable us to reach out to those who live around us, whom we have contact with as a part of our family or in our workplaces. We pray also for those who work around this building. Lord, we have such a wonderful message that you, the God of the universe, has condescended to bring his enemies, your enemies, to be your friends. And we are living proof of that. And all those who trust on you, who give up any reliance upon themselves to be right before you, all those can know this salvation, this joy in communion with you. Lord, we pray that you would fill our hearts again with the glory and the wonder of the gospel, that we might be ready to share it as we have opportunity. And we pray that as we think as a church, that you would guide us to those things that will be effective. We pray also that you would give us perseverance, both in our personal evangelism and in our corporate evangelism. We thank you also for Ronaldo and his labors and efforts, and we pray also that we might join him in these things more and more. We pray, Lord God, for the matters that were before presbytery yesterday. We pray that you would give us confidence in you amidst uh, frustration at the frailty of men. We thank you, Lord God, that you are in control of everything and that we can trust you with everything that happens. These things are not outside of your plan and you are working them for good if we believe your word. So Lord, fill us with a confidence in your word. Enable us by your spirit to trust you even when we do not understand. Lord God, we pray also that you would be with those who are suffering from various physical ailments, both those who have long-term pain and other uh, ailments such as cancer, that you would strengthen them, that you would uh, enable them to persevere through these things, that you would give the doctors wisdom, that you would enable them to get the care that they need, that you would, above all, draw them closer to you through this trial. We pray uh, for those of us who are abounding and full in various ways. We pray that you would give us eyes and ears to see and hear the needs around us and that you would make us to be servant-hearted in serving our brothers and sisters. We pray for those who are discouraged and downcast or burdened with many things that you would help your people to, to know that you are a rock that will never fail them, that they can draw real strength from you. We pray for this supernaturally to be applied to those who are particularly struggling in a, in a fog of discouragement which seems impervious to your truth sometimes. We pray that the light of your word would burn away that fog by the power of your spirit. And Lord, we pray uh, for those who have uh, recently moved to this country, recently be been coming to be a part of us. We pray that you would enable us both to make them feel welcome and you would 
help them as they settle here amongst us and in this country. We pray, Lord God, uh, that you would be with us as we meet for our AGM, that you would make that a useful time to your people, and that we would both be able to give thanks for what you have done over the past year, uh, to learn lessons and to look forward uh, at where we are going as a church, where you would have us go as a church in the year to come. We pray, Lord God, uh, that you would sustain and strengthen and even encourage our church plants in Hexham and Sunderland and Zurich. We pray that you would provide a minister for Hexham. We pray that you would uh, cause there to be uh, breakthroughs in uh, situations in each one of these congregations that, that seem um, insoluble. And Lord, we pray that you would gra- gain great glory in these ways. We pray that you continue to uh, lead and guide the Asian Fellowship and that you would use it as a tool for bringing those who are in false religion or uh, who are weak in their faith to the knowledge of the true and living God yourself or to a stronger, more biblical, more nourishing knowledge of you and practice of godliness. And we pray that you would encourage Hanuk and Raquel in the work that they are engaged in. Lord God, we pray now for the rest of our worship that you would continue to be with us and that you would fill our hearts and minds with confidence and confidence rooted fully in you and your character. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Please take your soldiers and turn with me to Psalm 1a. Psalm 1a, that can be found on page 1 in the Blue Sing Psalms books. Um, We're singing this psalm because we'll be thinking later about imitating Christ. And this psalm, of course, is about the godly man but the ultimate godly man is the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, And so uh, we see here not only uh, what we are to do, but the way we are to imitate Christ um, as his character, as the ultimate godly man is displayed for us. So let's now sing together Psalm 1a.
if you have a Bible, and please turn with me to Paul's letter to the Philippians in chapter 2. Paul's letter to the Philippians and chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. Please just listen to these words. You'll be in the company of many Christians throughout the ages who have just sat and listened to the Word of God. Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. We're now going to turn in our psalters again, um, this time to Psalm number 45, 45b, Psalm 45b, and that can be found on page uh, 58 in the books. And this psalm is a wonderful psalm. It's putting before us uh, Christ as our great king. Um, it's in the forms of the Davidic monarchy, but um, really it's, it's pointing us to Christ. Um, and Christ not only as our king, uh, but there's a picture of a marriage here. So it's, it's Christ and his church, that's us, his bride. So the psalm begins with praise to the king. A noble theme inspires my heart and mind as I recite my verses for the king. And then it, it goes on praising him to verse 10, where we're going to pick up. And here it, it's speaking to the bride, to us, the church. O oh daughter, listen and give ear to me. Forget your people and your father's house. See how your beauty has enthralled the king. Give honor to your Lord and royal spouse. So it's calling this bride to, to forget where she's come from and to, to follow after her king, her husband. And that's exactly what we are called to do with Christ, uh, to, to follow after him, to, to pursue him 
even after or as a bride pursues uh, her husband. So let's sing together Psalm 45b, and we'll sing together verses 10 to 17. ask God's help as we go to his word. Lord God, we are absolutely unable to understand or profit from your word apart from the work of your Spirit. Help me now as I preach your word to preach with clarity and power. Help your people to hear it with willingness to hear and to practice what they have heard in their lives. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. This morning, I want to draw your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and in particular, I want to focus your attention on verse 1. I'm in fact not going to go beyond verse 1. Verse 1 says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. These words really belong to the end of chapter 10 rather than to chapter 11. And so, as I read now, I'm going to start the reading in chapter 10, verses 23, and you'll see how 11.1 fits what goes before. Let's give our attention now to God's Word. 
1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Eat whatever is sold in the market, meat market, asking no questions for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions for conscience' sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I retake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food of which I give thanks? Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. In many ways, this little phrase that is our focus this morning sums up Paul's pastoral response to one of the problems in the Corinthian church. That was the problem of eating or not eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols. Or put another way, the use and misuse of Christian liberty. Paul has been dealing with this problem in one form or another at least since chapter 8. And his basic argument is this. The Corinthians are free to eat meat sacrificed to idols because idols are nothing, basically. Idols are not real gods. They're just the inventions of human minds and hands. However, that freedom, that freedom to eat a food sacrificed to idols is to be limited by two concerns. A self-denying care for those who would see that action as idolatrous, and secondly, a focus on the glory of God above all other things. And in this, Paul is setting himself forth as an example to the Corinthians. He also makes clear that this is no small matter. It's something that could potentially lead to the shipwreck of souls. The weak are vulnerable to being distracted away from Christ by the minutiae of whether or not to eat meat sacrificed to idols, and the strong are vulnerable to open the door to pride and to become lax about the things of God. Now, there's so many things that are applicable to us in that and that we could focus on. However, what I really want to focus with you on this morning is Paul's ministry pattern as he addresses this problem. Not many of us are elders and therefore in ministry in a formal sense, but there are those of us who are studying for the ministry amongst this congregation. And also, in Ephesians chapter 4, we read that elders are actually for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So I have news for you. Every one of you this morning, in a sense, has ministry to do. And that ministry is amongst each other in encouraging and strengthening, building up in appropriate ways, even uh, rebuking and exhorting one another. Each one of you has ministry to do, and so this pattern of ministry that we see in the Apostle Paul applies to you as well. Some of us are also parents called to minister to our children. Some of us 
have more experience in the Christian life and therefore are well-placed in a Titus 2 sort of way to, to be mentors to those who are younger than us, either in age or in uh, spiritual age. And that applies to both men and women. So I want to focus this morning on Paul's ministry pattern and particularly that pattern as it involves imitation. Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. This is something that the Lord has been laying on my heart in particular, and I'm glad to be able to share it with you. My title is Imitation in Ministry, and my points are Imitation is an important ministry pattern. Point two, imitation is our calling. And three, imitation is supernatural. Imitation is an important ministry pattern. Imitation is our calling. And imitation is supernatural. Paul's basic call in this phrase, and really throughout this section in 1 Corinthians, is come follow me. Come follow me. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. He's not simply instructing the Corinthians, not simply giving them information, uh, instructing their minds, uh, acting as sort of like a, a repository of information that they can download from. He's not even simply applying the Word of God into this pastorally difficult situation. Of course, he's doing that. He is doing those things, but he's doing it in the context of this call to imitation. He's like a military captain who says to his unit, after me, into the breach, who encourages and inspires his men by his example. He's like a father who says to his children in verbal and nonverbal ways, do as I say, but he makes his instruction concrete and tangible by living it out himself, who gives them motivation to obey by showing his children that he knows what they're going through. He knows the struggles, the, the difficulties, the, the challenges they're going through because he's doing the same thing who inspires their confidence by showing them that he's consistent in what he says and what he does. All throughout the last few chapters, Paul has been calling the Corinthians to self-denying love for God and each other. Just prior to the verse we're focusing on in chapter 10, verse 31, he says, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. In those verses just before, he also says of himself, but applying it to the Corinthians, that they are to seek not only their own profit, but the profit of many, that many might be saved. Now that should strike you as familiar because it didn't begin with Paul, did it? That uh, focus on the glory of God, that service of others, that didn't begin with the apostle Paul. This is exactly what Christ, our Lord and Savior, our Master, did Himself, was it not? That's why we read Philippians chapter 2. Let me remind you of, of just some of those verses we read. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. That's, he didn't hang on to his divine uh, outward expression. He veiled it in human flesh, but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And now, 
what Paul is doing in his own ministry is shaping it after the pattern of Christ. So at the end of chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, he says this, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Practically, that would just be quite hard and sacrificial for some of us, maybe not for others of us, but it's a massive commitment, isn't it? Um, But he's willing to do that for the spiritual good of his brothers and of those who the Lord is saving. Uh, He says then in chapter 9 that he renounces remuneration from the Corinthian church and even marriage though those things were his right though he he could have in all uh, rectitude demanded those things but he gives them up willingly he speaks of adapting himself in all non-doctrinal things to Jews and to Gentiles to the weak and to the strong that he might remove all unnecessary offenses to the gospel He says in chapter 9, verse 22, To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. In chapter 9, he also speaks of how he exercises great personal self-denial, comparing himself to an athlete who controls tightly his body uh, to run the race to to win the prize. He talks about bringing his body into subjection, or to put it another way, to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. And then in chapter 10, verse 33, again he says, I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many. These things marked the Apostle Paul's ministry, but as I said, they weren't original to him. They marked his ministry because they marked Christ's ministry and life. He was imitating Christ. Paul is ultimately not interested in drawing people to himself. He is interested in drawing people to Christ. His call is to imitate his imitation, to imitate his imitation of Christ, to follow Christ just as he follows Christ. He's ministering Christ to the Corinthians by his example. He longs, as he says to the Galatians, for Christ to be formed in these Corinthians by the Spirit of of God. He says to the Graysons, my little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. He labors that they might take on Christ more and more in their thinking, in their speaking, in their acting, in their responses to situations, in their affections, that they might more and more take on Christ in all of their life. Christ as he is that perfect specimen of godly manhood. But here's the thing. His exhortation, his exhortation to Christ-likeness, to Christ-like self-denial, is deeply connected to his own life and ministry. His exhortation to the Corinthians regarding food comes wrapped in, supported by his own life. And indeed, next to the power of the Holy Spirit, that is where it gets its power. This is his ministry pattern. He is going to pursue Christ with all that he has. He is going to imitate Christ. He is going to labor that Christ might be formed in him more and more 
so that he might turn to his brothers and sisters and say, come follow me, be formed by Christ like I am being formed by Christ. So his pattern is to pursue Christ that he might be able to exhort others to follow him in that pursuit. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now this is the essence of discipleship, isn't it? What did Christ do when he was calling his disciples? He said, come follow me. Come live with me. Come watch me. Come receive my teaching and then see how it is worked out in my life and then do likewise. This pattern of ministry is crucial for godly eldership. 1 Peter chapter 5, the elders who are among you I exhort, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. To the extent that we really minister Christ to anyone around us, whether we be formally in ministry or not, we also must follow this pattern, pursuing Christ that we might be able to say to others in some measure, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We are to imitate Christ so that others might imitate him by following us. This is, in fact, the counterintuitive way to truly Christ-centered, God-centered ministry to others. Think about it. Who in your life, what situation in your life has most pointed you to God? I'm sure there's many answers that you could give to that. But surely one of them is when you have experienced someone, come in contact with someone who is saturated by God, who, who just sort of uh, exudes godliness in all that he or she does. Does that really cause you to, to focus on them? Or does it, in fact, cause you to focus on the God that they are so taken up with? Oftentimes, it's the latter. It should be the latter. This also leads to solid, unhypocritical ministry, whether that is in a formal sense or in the informal sense that all of us are called to. This is probably most easily seen from a failure of it. To the extent to which we call others to imitate Christ without imitating him ourselves, there will always be some hypocrisy in our ministry to others. Our lives will at best be a distraction from truly ministering to others, or at worst, it will undo all that we say. On the other hand, when we are exemplary because we are imitating Christ, of course not perfectly, none of us can do that perfectly, but to the extent that we are exemplary, that we are pursuing Christ, that we are imitating Him, there will be an intangible weight added to our ministry to others, a a gravity, a a gravitas to that ministry. And Paul embodies that here, embodies this important pattern of gospel ministry. Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. We are to be imitating Christ in our lives 
and ministries in such a way that we can say with Paul, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. And so implied in this is a call to imitate Christ, which is my second point. How else are we to follow Paul's example? How else are we to be in a position to say to others, imitate me, if we are not imitating Christ? And this, of course, fits with the rest of Scripture. We are told that God predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son, and all those He predestined, He also called. The Christian life is having Christ formed in us, as we saw from previous scriptures. It's growing more and more in conformity to Christ. And therefore, as a Christian, you are called to imitate Christ. Much more those of us who are elders or are pursuing eldership, we are called to imitate Christ. But this is something for all of us. We need reminders of this. I think every last person in this room, or very many of us, are busy with all sorts of things, aren't we? We've got many responsibilities, many pressures on us. And we can fall into the trap of thinking, if I just get X, Y, and Z done, then I'm, I'm doing what I need to do. And this overarching goal of imitating Christ can recede in our thinking. Amidst the avalanche of good and right and even necessary things on our plates, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that fundamentally we are to be imitators of Christ, to lose sight of the fact that this is really the main thing. And the devil tries hard to distract us. Our own flesh is a wonderful accomplice to him, isn't it? If we're not distracted with the many things that we must do, it's always tempting to find easier things to focus on, to build our lives and our ministries to others upon. We can rely on our intellect, on our, our learning as we speak to others about the th things of Christ or as we build our Christian life, that, that we uh, read volumes um, and, and know a lot about the Word of God. We can focus on our adherence to reform distinctives, which are good. I'm, I'm not saying that's bad. That's wonderful. But we can focus that on that as the main thing above imitating Christ. We can focus as, as parents as we're leading our children on proper techniques. If we just get the right technique in, in training, then that's the key rather than really focusing on imitating Christ so that we might say to them, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We can focus on our gifts, on our personality. All those things are, are relatively easy to focus on. By contrast, imitating Christ is hard. It often lacks the excitement of, of these other things. It can bring us into opposition. It requires day in and day out uh, regular persistence in mundane spiritual disciplines. But this is what we're called to, brothers and sisters, to imitate Christ. There's a sense also in which this focus is something you might feel uncomfortable with. It might seem to you self-centered. If our first focus is ourselves pursuing Christ's likeness, isn't, isn't that selfish? Isn't there something selfish about that? How could we possibly, how could I possibly say to my brother and sister, imitate me? Isn't there something wrong about that? Perhaps you recoil from that. How, how could I actually say that? Surely the Apostle Paul could say that, but, but I couldn't say that, right? It might seem proud. But it's only proud 
if we're only appearing to imitate Christ, but it's really all about ourselves. If we're just putting a facade on of imitating Christ. Or if we aren't being honest about ways in which we fail to imitate him as fully as we should. None of us are fully as sanctified as we should be. I mean, this is well illustrated with parents, right? Um, if you're saying to your children, imitate me as I imitate Christ, they're living with you all the time. They know all your faults and, and foibles, and, and if you're just acting like you're a perfect specimen of Christ's likeness, then there's going to be a weakness in your saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ, because you're not being honest about the uh, disconnect sometimes between Christ and your imitation of him. So it can be self-centered. It can uh, turn into something that looks proud if you're not being honest about the ways in which you fall short. doesn't mean you shouldn't be pursuing that, but you just need to be honest with those who you're speaking with about your own weaknesses. But true imitation of Christ will lead us in the paths of humility. Is not Christ the one who was humble and lowly above all others? Is he not the, the, the perfect example of humility? So if we are truly imitating him, then it will lead us in paths of humility. Brothers and sisters, we are called to imitate Christ. And this is rightly applied in general to all of our lives. But I do want to take just a moment and think about the particular ways that Paul was applying that in this particular circumstance. Well, I think this is a principle that we're right to apply all of our lives. Paul was particularly focusing on two aspects of Christ's character, a focus on the glory of God above all others, and a seeking not our own profit, but the profit of many. And, and he was saying, Christ was like this, and I am like this. Brothers and sisters, did not Christ veil his own glory in human flesh and subject himself to infinite indignities from his virgin birth to the cross? Did he not lay aside his immediate interests for your salvation? Did he not have in view his Father's glory through every insult, indignity, and injury that he experienced here on this earth? This is his example. This is what Paul was following in him in. Now, don't get me wrong. We are called to stand for truth against wrong. There is even a time to stand against our brothers when they are wrong. Paul did that. Christ did that. That's part of our imitation of Christ too, imitation of Paul as he imitated Christ. But even then, our eye is to be primarily on the glory of God above all else and the good of his people. And we need to remember that because living together as a church is hard sometimes, right? I think we've experienced that over the last couple of years. Sometimes living with each other in families is hard. There's challenges, there's difficulties. We need to remember these particular ways that we are to imitate Christ in keeping the glory of God above all else and in seeking not only our own interests but the profit of the many. Think about the effect that this would have on our relationships with one another as we're imitating Christ in this way. The way in which it puts our differences into their proper perspective. The way in which it draws us out of ourselves 
to focus us on our God and on each other. The ease that this could bring into our marriages and to our relationships with our children and, and to our relationships with each other. The joy that this brings into relationships that would otherwise be eroded by little difficulties or never get started at all. We are called to lead each other in focusing on the glory of God above all things and in seeking not our own profit first and foremost, but the profit of the many. And to lead each other, in a sense, verbally and non-verbally, by saying, follow me in these things as I follow Christ. Brothers and sisters, we are called to imitate Christ. But how? It's true, isn't it, that Christ was born without sin. He had the Spirit without measure. This call to imitate Christ, when you actually sit down and think about it, could seem impossible. And in a sense, you'd be right. If not impossible, it's certainly practically hard. It should humble us. You shouldn't hear that call to imitate Christ and say, yeah, great, uh, wonderful, that's, I got that covered. That should overwhelm you by the magnitude of it, by the weight of it, by the seriousness of it. It should bring you to your knees. So it's important that we ask the question, How? How do we go about imitating the one who is perfect? How do we imitate Christ when it's so hard and difficult? Well, I think many of you know the answer. This is not just a matter of trying harder. It is supernatural. That's why I've entitled my third point. Imitation is supernatural. Hard work is necessary without doubt. And that's important. But no amount of natural effort will enable you to imitate Christ by itself. Christ himself in his manhood was thoroughly spirit empowered. His was the thoroughly Spirit-empowered life. If we are to imitate Him, ours must be too. We must be men and women given new life by the Spirit. First of all, we must be regenerated. We must have that new heart. We must be alive because the Spirit has made us alive. And we must be those more and more under the influence of the Spirit in all that we do. We must not be drunk with wine, as Ephesians says, but filled with the Spirit, more and more under the influence of the Spirit. More than that, Paul says later in 1 Corinthians, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace towards me was not in vain, that I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Very simply, the grace of God is Christ applied to us by the Holy Spirit. That is, that is God's grace in, in His empowering grace. And as we imitate Christ, it must be by the power of the Holy Spirit flowing out of our union with Christ in His death and resurrection. So we have died with Him and we are now having His new life worked into us more and more. Imitation is supernatural. If you set out to do it on your own strength, you will fail. It is impossible if you try to do it 
on your own strength. It is something that can only be done supernaturally. As we close, I want to first of all exhort you as this congregation to pray for me and for your elders. Because while this call, imitate me as I imitate Christ, is something that applies to all of us, there is a particular way in which it applies to us. And therefore, there's a particular weight and responsibility that rests on us even more so. And so pray for us. Pray that we will pursue Christ more and more. Pray that we will be protected from the wiles of the devil. Pray that we will increase more and more in holiness, that we might be able to say more and more to you, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Not, not for our own sake, not for our own uh, glorification or, or um, aggrandizement, but so that you might be more Christ-like so that we might lead you in Christ's likeness. Pray for us, please, daily. We need it. And then imitate Christ yourself. Imitate Him in your family, as husbands and as wives, as fathers, as mothers, as children. Imitate Him in your secret life, the elements of your life that no one else sees, in your thinking, in your responses to situations and to others, in your entrusting injustice to God. That's what Christ did, right? He experienced so much injustice, and what did He do? He entrusted Himself to God who judges justly. Imitate Christ in that, brothers and sisters, in dealing with the weak, in your stands for truth, in all of your life. Let me encourage you this afternoon, this evening, this week, do an inventory of your life, asking yourself the question, am I imitating Christ in this area and that area and the other area? And where you find that there is some difference between Christ and yourself, and I'm sure you will find it all over the place in one measure or not, repent. Confess these things, turn away from them, seek the grace of God to turn from them and to walk in a Christ-like way by the power of His Spirit, by His grace that more and more Christ might be formed in you. Let me speak to those who are younger, either in age or in spiritual maturity. You know, we can be arrogant, whether that's dealing with our parents or, or with those who are older than wiser than us. We sometimes have a need to prove ourselves, right? But we've simply had less time for Christ to work in us, for, for Christ's likeness to be worked in us, for God to discipline us. And therefore, the people in your life who are most Christ-like are wonderful gifts to you. That you might look at them as enfleshed examples of what it means to, to be Christ-like, that you might follow them in following Christ. Don't let your arrogance, don't let your need to prove yourself get in the way of that. It, treasure those examples. To the older amongst us, whether that be in spiritual maturity or in age, invite younger men and women, boys and girls, to imitate you as you imitate Christ. Now, I, I'm not necessarily saying go out and, and do that verbally, although you might in the right circumstance, but spend time with those who are 
younger than you spiritually or, or by age. Invest in them. Be patient with them. Live before them as an example of Christ's likeness. Show them how God has worked Christ's likeness into your life practically so that they might see how that, that works out in the real world. It's invaluable to have a, an older man or a woman, one more mature in Christ than you, come alongside and, and work through a problem that you're dealing with and, and show how Christ's likeness has been worked in them in that particular way. So you might see how that might, perf- that might practically work out in your own life. And that takes the older, the more mature amongst us being willing to reach out to those who are younger. I know you're busy. I know you've got loads on. I know that it can sometimes seem arrogant and proud. You know, none of, who wants to stand up and say, I'm the older one. I, I'm, I'm the more mature one. You know, I'm, I'm the one that people should follow. But, but think about it not as a, way of saying how good you are, but as a way of helping your brothers and sisters. You don't have to make a big song and dance about yourself anyway, because what are you saying to them? Not just imitate me, full stop. You're saying imitate me as I imitate Christ. You're ultimately pointing them to Christ. You're, you're focusing them on Christ. And then I say to all of you, in the measure that God has worked in you, regenerated you, is making you more like his son, be willing to, to live before one another that you might say, even just by implication, imitate me as I imitate Christ. You can only do that if you are committed to imitating him. So this morning, recommit yourself to that heart, mind, and soul by the power of the Spirit. Let's pray. O Lord, we thank you for Paul's example here We ask your forgiveness for all the ways that we don't imitate Christ. We recognize this standard as an immense one. And yet, Lord, this is what you've called us to. Help us to pursue your Son. Cause us to do so in reliance on you. And help us to do this, not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of others. That we might say in our words, and most especially in our lives, imitate me as I imitate Christ. In his name, amen. Brothers and sisters, we're going to sing now, and we're going to sing Hymn number 656. Hymn number 656 to God's glory.
Lift up your heads and receive the blessing of your God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.